Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. The Tough Girl Podcast is sponsorship and ad-free thanks to the monthly financial support of patrons. To find out more about supporting your favorite podcast and becoming a patron, please check out patreon.com forward slash tough girl podcast. There is over 230 patrons currently supporting the mission to help me increase the amount of female role models in the media. Take action now and become one of them. When you support at the $5 level, female listeners are invited to come and join the closed Facebook group, The Tough Girl Tribe. Tribe, I'm delighted we're going to be speaking to Sarah Hostrider, who is a globe exploring, international adventuring sailor and climber. Sarah's goal is to be the first woman ever to sail all the seven seas and to climb all of the highest summits on the world's seven continents. This feat would also see Sarah become the first person in history to have competed in the Volvo Ocean Race, which is also known as the Everest of Sailing. During her reign as a professional sailor, Sarah has sailed the equivalent of five laps of the planet and has no signs of slowing down. My name is Sarah Hostreiter, and I grew up in Wyoming, which is the cowboy state here in the U.S. out west. It's one of the big square states just north of Colorado, and uh, it's it's the least populated state in the U.S., and it's just kind of, you know, wide open prairie um, in between very small towns, and um, I grew up there between a town called Casper and Laramie, um, sharing time between my my parents. They divorced when I was young. So my dad's, we um, grew up on a really small farm and then kind of grew up in town in Casper with my mom. I am a sailor and professional athlete. I'm a keen climber, I would say, Um, but I've been focused on adventures and uh, charitable work for the past about 14, 15 years. Were you always quite adventurous as a young child, sort of, you know, going off into the farmland or, you know, getting out onto the sea? Um, where did this where did this sort of active you come from? Well, exploring oceans was definitely not a part of my youth. I, I think um, growing up in Wyoming, I couldn't have been further from the sea. And um, I didn't actually kind of go out onto the ocean until I was about 22, I think, for the first time. Um, but I did grow up very adventurous, you know, Wyoming is just a really adventurous place, uh, with lots of wide open spaces and wild places. And, you know, we did a lot of hunting and fishing and camping growing up and, you know, kind of even the farm life was a bit exotic at times. Um, you know, it's just a very harsh place with the environment there. Um, but you know, just that like really this huge sense of like freedom and exploration and curiosity was kind of instilled in me as a child and, um, you know, kind of being alone in, in big landscapes like the mountains, um, you know, I think kind of transferred over for me into being comfortable to be out at sea and, you know, enjoying that space, like being in nature and being physically removed from, uh, you know, like society or, or land or otherwise. Did you have like a traditional career path? So did you finish high school and then go on to college or did you finish high school and then, you know, take a gap year or go traveling? What was, what was the journey after high school? You know, I, I went straight into university, but I really found while I was going to university that those years while you're in school, you know, while you're in the process of earning your university degree are the best years of your life to take time off from school and go have adventures because you can just tell people, you know, the whole time, no one's giving you grief basically for going off and studying abroad or working abroad because you're still getting your university degree. You're just taking some time. So, um, I took, I mean, about between five and seven years to get my four year degree. Uh, but I, studied abroad in France. I worked abroad in New Zealand. I had, um, three separate trips to Africa. I had a course in Kenya. I had internships in Africa and the Caribbean, uh, throughout going to school. 
And I did a lot of independent studies within that as well. So even though I kind of went down a quotable traditional path of, you know, going to university, I really kind of made my degree, my own exploration and, you know, figured out as I went along, like where my interests lie and, you know, kind of wanted to learn those things through physically being a part of them rather than just being removed and studying them from afar. What were you studying? What was your degree in? Uh, it ended up being international studies with a regional focus in Africa in the language of French. But what that really translated to was something like a political science degree with a regional focus in Africa. And um, I really focused on the social side of HIV AIDS was kind of my particular subject that I started um, honing in on, I think maybe my second year of, of university. And that was what I kind of worked through during my university years and then internships. And by the time I finally came out of university, I actually felt like I needed a bit of a, a break from that side of it because it had just been, you know, when I take on something, no matter what it is, I really go all out for, you know, years at a time. Um, so at the end of my university studies, um, I found myself back in the Caribbean following an internship, and I just wanted a bit of a break before I went back and got my master's, which I ended up not doing because I started sailing. But, you know, so it was kind of traditional, kind of not. So you're in the Caribbean, and, and is that where you first sort of picked up the sailing or your love of sailing? Yes, absolutely, which, you know, it, it's easy to see why you would pick that up in some place like the Caribbean. You know, you've got the steady trade winds, the beautiful weather, you've got the turquoise sea. Um, like to me, it's, it's harder to understand why people take up sailing, you know, growing up in places like Brittany, France, or, you know, even the UK is, it's not so inviting <laughs> to go out on those waters all the time. I've done a lot of sailing over there the past, I don't know, um, six, seven years. Um, but you know, the Caribbean, it almost kind of lulls you into this, um, sense that sailing will be like that everywhere around the world I was going to say it must because you've you've done the the Volvo ocean race which has been described as the longest and toughest professional sporting event in in the world it's a massive test of teamwork and, and you know human endurance and, and adventure and so that's probably very very different from from Caribbean sailing but how would you say that your your sailing career progressed? Was it in terms of just going out there in the Caribbean and practicing, or did you go out straight away and start collecting qualifications, or did you know that this is something that you wanted to take further? You know, my initial interest was to cross an ocean, and coming from Wyoming, you know, being this landlocked state and not being familiar with the ocean at all, and then not comfortable with it. Um, it was something, it really scared me, uh, you know, and it still scares me because it's a very, very powerful place that you really need to respect. But I just kind of thought, you know, it would just be this grand adventure to cross an ocean. I couldn't think of anything, you know, more exciting than to do that. And that was my initial push was just, just to figure out how to do that. And, um, I had been sailing, uh, you know, I did two regattas, uh, in the Caribbean where, you know, I was not on any type of a race boat, just kind of cruising boats. And, you know, I was just there, you know, with enthusiasm really. And I found out there was a rally for cruising boats that, um, goes across the Atlantic ocean and they, they do it in the form of a race. So it's really fun and you don't use your engine. So, you know, it's traditional in that sense. And they stop along the way. So they go from the Caribbean to Bermuda to the Azores and on to Portugal is the finish. And, um, kind of that initial journey that was 31 days and that initial journey for me, like I just started reading all the books on board about heavy weather sailing. And there was a lot of kind of inspirational reads, uh, by, you know, people like Ella MacArthur, Dee Kafari, Pete Goss about, uh, solo ocean racing, um, and some crude ocean racing kind of at the professional sailing level. And this opened up a whole new world to me. I, I did not know that <laughs> sailing was really a thing. I didn't know that there was races across oceans. I had no idea you could be a professional sailor. But by the time I hit Portugal, I had kind of decided that, you know, this is what I wanted to do. And I wanted to, you know, I wanted to be on sailboats and I wanted to be a professional sailor. 
And the first step um, in that, you know, is kind of collecting these qualifying miles. And, you know, I ended up doing 8,000 miles on that first trip. Uh, We went on to Greece from Portugal. And then I did some safety courses in the U.S. And I got a job. Um, I still don't know how this person found me just very luckily um, on an 80 foot cruising catamaran that did racing in the Caribbean. And so that next year or, you know, eight months that I was with that boat, we did a whole bunch of regattas down in the Caribbean. And I was kind of able to be around people who were professional sailors and kind of, you know, pick their brains. And, you know, I was really naive in a lot of ways, which I, looking back was really a gift to me because I wasn't intimidated by anyone or anything really, because I was so unfamiliar with the professional sailing world. And, um, my boat was staying in the Caribbean and people just said, you know, if you wanted to keep racing, then I needed to go up to Newport, Rhode Island in the U S and, um, I did. And, you know, just kind of from there, just for extended periods of time, just every person I met, you know, I told them my objective and my agenda and, you know, that I wanted to sail and race as much as I could. And, um, I never really went into the certification side of things. Like, you know, in the UK, you can kind of step in there from day one and do your, you know, competent crew and your day skipper and your coastal skipper and your yacht master and your yacht master ocean. And, you know, I didn't do things that way. I went out and got experience and and met people and did things through, um, just kind of connections and stuff like that. Uh, and in the racing side of things, pieces of paper, didn't really mean much. It was more about recommendations. So, um, you know, I really figured out pockets within sailing where I could learn faster, um, and really tried to hone in on, on those to reach what was then my goal to do a double handed transatlantic race, which is just two people. Um, and while I was working on that project, the Volvo ocean race, um, all female team with team SCA became available, which, you know, was pretty much a once in a lifetime opportunity. And so I, I went for that one and and that was how I carried into like what would then be, you know, like the tippy top of the professional sailing world. Tell us more about that race because, you know, all female team, which I absolutely love, absolutely incredible. Um, it's, but it's, it's a 40,000 mile race course. It's 24 seven. It's intense. Tell us what it was like, you know, a, you know, being accepted. Cause I know that there's, um, you know, really, really very, very competitive to get on that boat. And you know, you were one of the 13 women chosen. What was that like for you? You know, the actual process of making the team was so intense, um, that by the time I got to the hardest race on the planet, I almost, it was a, just a huge relief. <laughs> um, our, there was 450 women who applied to be a part of that team because there hadn't been any opportunities like this built exclusively for women at this level of sailing. So, you know, many, many amazing, talented women around the world were really interested. And, uh, the process to put this team together took about a year and a half. Um, and I was kind of a part of the process for about eight months before I was finally, you know, officially made a part of the team. And, um, you know, from the time I actually applied to the time I was officially on the team was about, about a year and a half. Um, so that was a year and a half of just blind passion on my side, you know, like you just have to believe in yourself so much and really, really want the opportunity and be able to put in the work when no one's watching so that when the opportunities became available, you know, you were able to show either your progress or your level of dedication. Um, and yeah, it was, it was, a uh, really physically and mentally very, very difficult to become a part of team SCA. And it was just something like I felt it in my soul and I wanted it so bad. Um, you know, and when, when I was finally chosen, I just, I couldn't believe it. 
uh, you know, but there was also girls in the same breath who lost the opportunity. And, um, you know, one of the women had been there for a full year and kind of given up her future, her next Olympic campaign, um, because she thought she was going to have a chance with the team. So, you know, it was my dreams were coming true while I was watching someone like, you know, or people I cared about, you know, losing their dream. So it was, um, it was a hard, you know, couple of weeks in there. Um, and then even making the team itself, you just realized, oh my goodness, my dream just came true, but I have this impossible, um, challenge ahead of me as the Volvo ocean race, you know, and the way everyone talked about it, like our coaches, some of our coaches had done the race like five, six, seven times, but the way that everyone would speak about it was that it was just this like, you know, unbelievably tough journey that no one could ever fully describe to you unless you do it yourself. And, um, in that way, it just, you know, it was, it was something that I reflect on now. I think it's pretty funny that, you know, we would go to see every single day training for, you know, a year and a half before the race started. Yet for some reason, I thought when we crossed the starting line for the Volvo ocean race, that the sea would somehow be a different place that day or those next 40,000 miles. And, you know, it's, <laughs> it's just another day on the water, but it's, um, there's huge challenges in the length of the race, uh, the, the pace of the race as well. You know, you, it's, it's nine months, but you really want some downtime, um, in between some of those legs that you, you don't get because there's also commercial demands as well. You know, part of your job is, is to be an ambassador for your sponsors, um, as an athlete and otherwise. And, um, you know, that's as much a part of it as it is to, you know, be a sailor and a teammate on the water. So it's a very, very demanding, very rewarding process. Um, that it's just, it's just a beast, you know, it's a, it's a huge machine. Um, but you know, it's like the pinnacle of human endeavor in a lot of ways, like team endeavor. So it's, it's a, it's a fantastic thing to be a part of. How did you get through the, the toughest days out on, out on the water? I mean, I mean, I know there must've been hundreds of instances and moments and these incredible high points, but also these, these low points where it was maybe just all too much. Like, how did you get, how did you get through that? You know, I think, uh, there's a, there are a couple of things, you know, keeping things, keeping things relative for me is really important. So at the lowest lows, at the most difficult, painful moments, I would often think about how lucky I was to be there. Not just in terms of the, you know, the hundreds of women who desperately wanted my position on the boat, but the fact of, you know, coming from doing humanitarian work, I've seen what real struggle is in the world. And I understand that a lot of the challenges that I take on are a choice. And I'm very, very lucky to have those hardships be an option because for many people in the world, they're not. So, you know, that's how I would get through stuff. Just thinking about how lucky I was to be there, even when it's just, you know, the scariest place or the most exhausting or the most painful place you've ever been before. You're still damn lucky to be there. Yeah. Absolutely. So sailing is only part of what you do because you also do do climbing and climb mountains. Tell us more about how you got into climbing mountains and how you started um, going after the seven summits. You know, it really just evolved for me. Uh, you know, I felt like mountains were kind of more in line with who I was and how I grew up than the ocean ever was. Um, I'm really passionate about sailing and I'm very in love with, you know, racing and, and everything around it and the people I've met through it. But, you know, kind of mountains for me felt like, you know, where I came from and there was a really difficult period kind of, you know, around six months to a year after I finished the Volvo ocean race where it wasn't just difficult for me, but it was really difficult for the women that I had sailed around the world with. A lot of us just, you know, were struggling to find opportunities 
at all, you know, not just at the highest levels, but at any level. And, you know, a lot of girls were doing sailing for free and, you know, it just wasn't, it was making me fairly negative and I just didn't want to be that way. Um, and so I wanted a challenge that to me was the equivalent of the Volvo because we weren't sure if we were going to have a chance for women to be a part of the race again. We had kind of reorganized ourselves as a group, um, with the women I sailed with, uh, into something called the Magenta Project. And we were looking for money for the next Volvo ocean race. And we'd kind of set a timeline for ourselves and said, you know, if we don't have, uh, money by this date, it's probably not going to happen. And then, you know, everyone should just try to to figure out their own thing or otherwise. And I just was really frustrated that in a sport that I loved so much, um, a lot of the bias against me came from my gender and, and not from who I was as a sailor. And I really struggled with that. And the mountains to me were something that I could choose to go do. And no one could tell me no. You know, it was kind of just, I could take on the smallest hill or the biggest mountain in the world. And, you know, the mountain won't be any more or less kind to me because of my gender. And, um, you know, it was just, it was something, it was an an initiative and an adventure that I could take um, without needing permission from someone. And I decided to climb Mount Everest. That was, that was how I you know, kind of saw the next goal. And I thought, okay, you know, for me, it was something as big as the Volvo ocean race. And how do I get there? I gave myself two years and, you know, I started kind of mapping out like a training schedule and training peaks. And, um, you know, a lot of people think that Mount Everest is something that's, you know, kind of cliche by now, because there's hundreds of people every year who, you know, attempt it or summit it. But to me personally, coming from my background and coming from something like the Volvo Ocean Race to then do something as big as Everest, you know, and those are two, those are the the polar opposite in terms of sports. You know, one is the Everest of sailing and one is actual Everest. And, you know, there's more than 29,000 feet of elevation between those two challenges and a whole lot of blood, sweat, and tears in between. And as I saw the challenge evolving, um, I kind of recognized that it needed to be bigger than Everest and it needed to be bigger than someone who had done the Volvo and was planning to climb Mount Everest. And I just kind of recognized that, you know, I had nearly completed the seven seas of the world and I was using some of the seven summits to, um, to train for Mount Everest. And so I kind of came to the notion of seven C seven summits and there's never been a female to do it. There's been one person in history ever, a gentleman, um, originally from California. So that was how I kind of came to the seven C seven summits project. And, you know, I think it's, it's really exciting to me just from a really internal perspective to like be able to explore all of those amazing corners of the planet. You know, I'm really, really fascinated with exploration and, and the world and the natural world. And, um, I just, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's just like such an ingrained passion in me now to like pursue and complete, um, this project. And, you know, there's, there's so much that can go on on the outside of the project in terms of like charity work and inspiration and, you know, I think it's, um, to do something that magnanimous or monumental is just, you know, it's, it's a privilege. Tell us more about the project seven C seven summits. I mean, how, how are you getting along? You've got, uh, yeah. How many more mountains have you got to go? I have, I have four more mountains to go. I've got Denali, Everest, Karsten's pyramid and Mount Vincent in Antarctica. And um, what's, what's next on the, have you got plans to, to summit any of them in 2019? Yes. So, uh, Denali is planned for May of 2019 and, um, I could complete, uh, the, the remaining four within, you know, May of 2020 
Um, but my biggest challenge to date has actually been the, the corporate sponsorship side of things. Um, and considering all of the massive endeavors and adventures that I've had, I have to say this was, this, this is, and continues to be the, the hardest aspect of the challenge so far. What tips have you got around corporate sponsorship? Have, you know, what's worked for you? Well, I haven't really been super successful with it. Um, you know, but I think the most important thing, and this is the way that I approach any big challenge or training for any big challenge. And I kind of approach sponsorship in the same way is just that every single day, try to do something that's moving you forward in the, in the direction of your goal. And for me, whether it, that is working on my website or sending emails or, you know, keeping up with social media or spending hours in the gym every day, because you can't necessarily not physically train for these things because you're waiting to find out if you're ever going to find the money. Because if the, if the money is going to come, if the partnerships are going to happen, you need to be ready and you need to show already that you have been, you know, committing to this project as much as you're asking for people to commit to you. So I think, you know, doing as much training as you can and just working every day, you know, step by step, that's the same way you climb a mountain. That's the same way you cross an ocean, you know, a mile at a time or a, a one step at a time, you know, you, you never take any of these things, you know, at once. So just been steadily working on it. And, um, you know, one of the biggest challenges I find is, you know, it's, it's a personal project. So I don't have, you know, a, a marketing firm or, you know, a, a management company kind of helping me along and believing me and cheering me on. And so the biggest thing every day is like, I have to decide every day to keep doing this every day. I have to believe in myself enough, believe in the project enough that I continue to work on it. And, you know, I'm two years in now and I'm still just, just as passionate as, as ever, you know, maybe even more so because I'm so invested at this point. And yeah, I think sponsorship is, it's tough, you know, um, anyone going up for it, you know, you know I wish, wish them luck, <laughs> a whole lot of luck. Um, but yeah, belief in, in yourself and what you're trying to convince others to believe in about you, the, that needs to be genuine as well. I mean, how do you keep motivated? Because, you know, you've been pursuing this dream for, you know, for, for two years now. And it's, and it's hard when you don't necessarily have, um, you know, other, other people around you. And it's you who's got to drive it forward. It's you who's got to be committed. It's you who's got to have this unwavering belief in you and what you can achieve. How do you, how do you keep going? Uh, I mean, it really is for me, in a way I, I, I'm lucky, but I'm also slightly cursed uh, in the form of being able to be so obsessively passionate about things. Um, whatever has been my kind of life focus, I dedicate everything to it. And, you know, my dad and I had this discussion the other day and I was kind of just regressing and looking, you know, at, at how I was as a child with, with everything, you know, whether it was horses or whether it was reading or, um, you know, whether it was humanitarian work and then it was sailing and, and now it's this project. And it's kind of like every time I've had a thing, I just give it everything. Um, my dad wishes that I could balance things a bit better in my life. Like I don't particularly, um, get too concerned with like a personal life or anything really outside of my project and my sailing world and kind of my fitness world, you know, that is my bubble. And that's, that's what I choose to give my energy towards. Um, and you know, it's kind of that obsessive drive, um, you know, and passion that just gives me enough every day to keep going. Yeah. Yeah. How are you living at the moment? Are you making a living through sailing still, or do you have another job, or you know, how are you making your money? Um, I have still been making my money through sailing. 
sometimes it's kind of a balance. Like, you know, the summer I was very busy. Well, really kind of most of this past year for about nine months of it, I was very busy with sailing. And then, um, my winter sailing plans, the project that we had planned actually got canceled. And instead of kind of rushing to find another sailing thing, I knew I really needed to concentrate on my project because when I get into sailing, it's, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's very full time. Um, the sailing world is not a career, it's a lifestyle. So it's kind of, you know, you're, you're living somewhere because of it. You're, you know, in kind of crude housing. Um, and you know, it's, it's everything that you're doing. So for me to kind of focus on my own project, um, I've just kind of taken the past probably two or three months Um, I was also getting over knee surgery, so I knew that physically I really needed to have some dedicated time period, um, where I was in one place really concentrating on those things. So for me, I, I kind of just go between having enough money to feed myself to, you know, then kind of working and saving up a little bit so that I can then extend it and keep, you know, either working on my project or physically working out. So for me, it's, it's a balance, but I haven't really found anything. I don't work outside of sailing. Not you. And um, so talking about your, your knee injury, I believe that relatively, um, coming off your injury that you were climbing Mount Elbrus, um, relatively soon after, after that, do you want to tell us a little bit more, more about that? Yeah, that was, um, that was my first knee injury, uh, I do try to tell people that if you, if you do things, you know, if you go out and you're adventurous and you do tough sports, like you are going to have injuries. Um, just, you know, that's just a, that's just a part of it. So, um, I had actually partially torn my MCL and I had a deep bone contusion on my tibial plateau and I had been climbing the whole summer on it, but I was in France and I didn't have a chance to get an MRI for them to tell me fully what was wrong until the very end. Um, and so they just said, you need to sit still, like you cannot move. If you still want to, you know, be doing things, you need to sit on your butt and you need to be on crutches. So I had, I had Elbrus coming up and already planned and I was just bound and determined that, um, you know, this knee injury wasn't going to get in the way of it. So I, uh, I didn't do anything for three weeks and I went everywhere on crutches and I was in Chamonix, France. And I just stared at Mont Blanc every day from, you know, my Airbnb, uh, room and, um, kind of my friend picked me up and we went and dropped my crutches off. And then I went to the airport and went to Elbrus and, um, thankfully it's, it's not a very long climb or a very challenging climb. Uh, the challenge with Elbrus is often just the weather. So, you know, we kind of went for a training hike one day and, and came back and my leg was just, you know, just involuntarily just vibrating because my muscles <laughs> weren't really developed anymore. Um, so, you know, I kind of just had to suck it up to get that one done. And, um, then I came back and rested for a while. And then this year I've had two major injuries, which really set me back, which is why I've been training so hard. I, I fractured my pelvis in February sailing. I was on a Volvo 70 going very fast and I got smacked with a wave and thrown into something and it, it fractured my sacrum. So that was several months of sitting still. And, um, and then I kind of came back into sailing for the summer and, um, the, the sitting still after the pelvis fracture potentially created some problems within my knee, like some scar tissue developed. And, um, I ended up, my knee ended up giving out the day before a race and went and they decided that it was time for surgery. So that was mid July. I had surgery and, um, you know, it, it wasn't a quick recovery process, but like I've been working so hard now to just try to compensate for a lot of the stuff with kind of just the muscle development but, you know, I was really starting from scratch a couple months ago and I'm about 20 weeks into the training now. And, um, I'm, you know, I've got a fantastic, um, like personal training group that helps me out and I'm 
really pleased with how far we've come and, you know, I'm ready to finally get back out into the mountains and start training there again and, you know, keep up the gym side as well. I mean, just going back to the, the injury, cause I could, it must've been one of the most frustrating and difficult things to deal with, especially having to sit still and, you know, not to move and not to exercise. Um, and for somebody obviously who's been so fit and so active for, for all of your life, how did you cope with that? You know, with not being able to, to do what you normally did, how did you get through that difficult time? Uh, you know, it's, it's very easy to, you know, slip into depression when you're someone who is so kind of, uh, you know, just chemically dependent on the stimulus that you give yourself through exercise and kind of adventure and, and being outside. And, um, it was something I was just, you know, actively fighting every day. And, uh, I actually started meditating a lot and, kind of the meditation just helped me to relax my mind while I was trying to relax my body. Um, because otherwise I'm really, really hard on myself and, you know, it's, you always feel like you should be doing something, as I said before, doing something every day to be moving towards your goal. But there are times where you have to stop and you have to stop completely. Otherwise, you know, it's going to set you back further and further. So I have had to really practice patience several times in the past year and a half. And, uh, you know, just kind of not push things too soon. Um, but you know, know that injuries heal and these things pass and, you know, just try to basically give yourself a break, you know, just try to, be, be as kind to yourself as you would want someone else to be, or as you would be towards someone else who was, you know, injured, you know, it's not the end of what they're trying to do. It's just a, it's a really large speed bump. <laughs> no, absolutely. And, you know, thank you for being so so positive and providing those sort of like those top tips and advice. Cause I know it can be, it can be so difficult out there. Um, so in terms of, you know, you've been, you, you've done incredible sailing challenges. You are an adventurer. You you are an you are an athlete. What advice and tips would you have for other women who want to follow maybe a slightly different career path? You know, do something similar, either getting into the sailing world or the adventure world, or the or being or being an athlete. Um, yeah, what advice and tips would you have? Um, I mean, several. Just you know, I I luckily was raised by a mother who she was the first, uh, female U S marshal in the state of Wyoming where I grew up and it was a male dominated, uh, workplace and field. And, you know, there was very few, uh, female U S marshals in the U S at the time, but my, it was never kind of pointed out to me that, you know, that my mom deserved to be there, even though she was a female or anything like that. It was just kind of expected to me that, that men and women were equal and that, all of these opportunities are available to men and women. It's just a a matter of women kind of taking the initiative to be, you know, to want to be a part of those things. And I mean, it honestly wasn't until kind of a couple years into my sailing career that my gender was really brought up as something that was a negative thing to me. Um, And because it wasn't something that I focused on either, no one else did prior to this person kind of pointing it out to me. And I just kind of feel like, you know, women do deserve to be everywhere and do anything that they want to do. And so I think rather than entering some place or some stage or some career path, um, with a belief that we don't belong there and that we're challenging something, I think is sometimes, you know, a negative mindset that can play against us. So I think, you know, having the full belief because it's true that we deserve to, to be a part of whatever we choose to be a part of, I think that can kind of, you know, open more doors other than trying to, you know, kind of beat them down. Um, I think that's, that's one of the biggest things that, you know, I think a lot of women end up facing is just kind of, you know, a fear 
um, that they don't belong in some place because of their gender. And then, you know, outside of that, the biggest thing I think that I have kind of allowed myself that I see a lot of people don't is that I've given myself permission to do these things. And it's not like I just said at one time 10 years ago, okay, I'm going to give you permission to like live an adventurous life and not always have a plan and not always know what you're doing. It's not that it's, it's something that I have to go back to and visit all the time. Like, am I, am I doing the right thing? You know, I, I don't have a house. I don't have a dog. I don't have a husband. I don't have children. None of those things are my priority. I don't, you know, one way or another, each of us chooses our own path and we have different priorities, but you know, you are allowed to dictate what your priorities are, not society, not, you know, the commercial side of society that, that tells you what the expectations of you should be. You know, it's, you are free to, um, to shape your world however you want. And, you know, that's kind of what I've allowed myself as I've just given myself permission. And, um, you know, just kind of understanding as well that, that people aren't going to read your mind or read your heart and create these opportunities for you. You need to create those opportunities. You need to get your ass off the couch and you need to, you know, create these changes in your life. Um, I think sitting back and waiting for those things to happen to you, life doesn't happen to you. You know, you create these things. So also just, you know, having self-initiative is, is really important. Um, and I think, you know, as far as life lessons, those are probably some of my, my best ones I could throw out there. Oh my God, it's so good as well. <laughs> it's like, I mean, no, it's absolutely true. I love that. I love what you said about, you know, taking initiative, getting yourself off the couch, making it happen, going after what you, going after what you want. So, so inspiring. And, and that's what you're doing um, with Seven Seas and Seven Summits. It's going to be amazing to follow along on your journey. And Sarah, where is the best place that people can follow along or find out more about, uh, more about you and your future challenges? Um, they can go to my website, which is www.sarah with no H. So S A R A dot blue, like the color, because no one can spell my last name. So I couldn't use that in a, in a website. Awesome. That's absolutely perfect. And I'll make sure I put all of the links to your Twitter, Instagram, and your website in the show notes. But Sarah, thank you so much for coming on to the Tough Girl podcast to share your story. It's been absolutely inspiring. Thank you, Sarah. Those were, those were just great questions. Um, yeah, that was really great. Drive, I hope your January is getting off to a cracking start and that you have been motivated and inspired to take on your own adventures. Just want to say a massive thank you to everybody who has been leaving reviews on iTunes because it does help other people think, should I listen to the Tough Girl podcast or not? So there's currently 170 ratings on there at the moment and I thought I'd just read a couple of the reviews out. Now, I do apologize now if I butcher um, your your name, but I will do my best. So this was left by Mienken, M-E-E-N-A-K-S-H-I, one, two, three, four, five. Mienakshi, one, two, three, four, five, says, um, I chanced upon this podcast and have been hooked to it ever since. Sarah Williams has managed to create some of the most incredible stories of, of adventures undertaken by women. Whilst almost all of them are physical challenges, what they have in common is the mental toughness they exhibit. Just the other day, while out on a jog, I was listening to Jessica Hepburn's story. And at a certain point during the interview, I had tears streaming down my face. and I just had to break into an applause. Luckily, this was in the woodlands and there was only a few trees around. Sarah's questions are intuitive and gently probing and never intrusive. She steers the conversation with a firm hand while letting the subject unpack their story. 
what fabulous unfolding of stories it is. I've since gone on to support Sarah's work on Patreon and I think more of us should. So thank you so much for leaving the review and thank you so much for becoming a patron. I really do appreciate it. Kelly Oldham says, all the stories I've listened to so far are incredibly inspiring and motivating, but I especially love that you can get so much more out of the episodes than just tips on fitness and sports. Love the histories, antidotes and various recommendations about living a meaningful life. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, Peaches Divine says, I listen to this podcast on the way home from work, particularly if I had a training session scheduled and I'm starting to talk myself out of it. The women on this podcast are so inspiring that you can't talk yourself out of your run when you hear what they have achieved. Listen, I listen to this every time. Listen to this every time you're thinking of skipping a session and you'll get it done. It's so inspiring. Dragon Lord 777 um, or these are all five star reviews by the way says these podcasts are great to get you motivated into following your passions especially those involving adventure and travel um Isabel 3333 says would love more representation and gave three stars good podcast they starting to feel alienated as feels as though as feels like adventuring is not for WAC women of color would be great to have more guests from a wider cultural background so I just want to say a massive thank you to Isabel for providing this feedback because I do need this feedback and sometimes I get into my own little world and I don't necessarily realize that I may be putting out very, very similar people and similar stories. So um, I'm going to make it a real mission of mine to make sure that I do get more women of color on the podcast and more guests from a wider cultural background. If you know women who would fit the profile and who have an incredible story to share, please do let me know. Send me an email, sarah at toughgirlchallenges.com. I want to make sure that I'm giving you the content that you want to listen to. So Isabel, thank you so much. Um, your feedback really does mean a lot to me and I'll be working very hard this year to make sure that I increase the amount of representation and the diversity that I have on the podcast. If you'd like to leave a review for the Tough Girl podcast, please go and do it. I know it can be a pain to go to iTunes and click in and and all that sort of stuff, but it does make a, a massive difference in encouraging other people to listen, even just sharing it. And it's very, very powerful to share um, via word of mouth, just telling somebody, showing them, you know, not grabbing their iPhone, but grabbing their phone and say, hey, do you listen to podcasts? Check out this podcast, search for the Tough Girl podcast, especially if, they, if they've if they signed up for a marathon this year, they've signed up for a triathlon, they've got New Year's goals or resolutions that they want to achieve in relation to sports and fitness and they want to get out there and they are stepping outside of their comfort zone. The Tough Girl podcast can help them. It can keep them motivated and inspired while they are training. They can also hear other women who've been in a similar situation situation before and think okay well this is what she did this is what I can learn from her let me apply that to my own life loads more information on the website toughgirlchallenges.com um, thank you again for all of your incredible support I could not do this without you especially the patrons who are supporting me financially every single month it allows me to put this content out there and to earn a living from it so please do go check out patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash toughgirlpodcast have an incredible day wherever you are whatever you are doing just get out there smash it have some fun and give it 110% the more you put into anything the more that you are going to get out of it And that applies to everything. Have an awesome day. And I'll be back with you next Tuesday for another awesome episode of the Tough Girl Podcast. Take care, lots of love, and I'll speak to you soon.